The applications that we're going to cover in section 6.6 .6 are exponential growth and decay. And just looking at these, you can tell that they're exponential functions, right? Like this function a of t, it has an exponential component to it, right? e being raised to this power. And the only way that logs really come into it is like if you have to solve for t or if you have to solve for k, which will end up happening, right? Because then you try to get e to the power by itself on one side, take the natural log of both sides to get the thing that you're trying to solve for out of the exponent. So yeah, that'll happen. But these two formulas, they're really the same thing. Um, it's just that with decay, you have the negative k, and with the growth, you have the positive k. That's the only difference, but it's the same overall setup, right? Really, it's the same formula. And decay, you have the negative k. So if you look down here, k is supposed to be the rate of growth or the rate of decay. Um, when that's negative, then um, the more time has elapsed, then the smaller this expression e to the negative kt is going to be. So then that's how you get the decay to work out correctly with the negative exponent there. But then with growth, you have a positive exponent. Then that way as t gets bigger, the exponent gets bigger, so this whole expression gets bigger, right? So that would be growth, you get a larger value. All right, as far as what the other symbolism means, which most of it's down here, a of t is the amount of whatever at time t. So depending on if it's growth or decay, I guess that would largely define what the amount would be of. The most common application for exponential growth would be something like the growth of bacteria. Um, that can be modeled pretty well with exponential growth or with an exponential model. So there, um, a sub t would be the amount of bacteria after time t has elapsed. Um, or for decay, the most common thing, like the most common application is probably like the, um, the decay of a radioactive substance. So then A of T would be the amount of the substance that, that's left after however much time has passed. Then the A sub zero in both cases, that's the initial amount. So A sub zero is the amount at time zero. So you could write it as like in this format, like A of zero with the zero in parentheses. That makes this look sort of confusing though, because then it looks like you multiply a by zero on the right side, and that's usually why it's not written that way. Then t is time, so like the amount of elapsed time, um, and then that's basically it. The only other thing was the k or negative k, which is the growth, the or the the uh, rate of growth or the rate of decay, depending on which one of these you're looking at. Okay, so then the other thing that's on this page. Um, half-life, which is the big application for rate of decay. So the way that half-life works, um, if you haven't had chemistry in a while, is that the half-life is how long it takes for the amount of your radioactive substance to decay down to half of whatever you started with. So, right, that's why it's the half-life. It's how long does it take to get down to half? And then carbon dating is a way that half-lives get used a lot, or I guess really it's one half-life, it's the one for carbon-14. But um, when you have a living organism, the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 stays the same, so it's constant. Um, carbon-12 isn't radioactive, so that stays the same after the organism dies. But carbon-14 is radioactive, and its known half-life is roughly 5,700 years, so after the organism dies, then the amount of carbon-14 starts to decrease. So the way that carbon dating works is it uses the, um, basically the amount of carbon-14 that's left relative to the amount of carbon-12 compared to what that would be if it was a living organism. And then that's how you can figure out when the organism died. So that's the general idea of how it works. And I figured that was at least worth mentioning here. The first example is growth, and it is bacteria. So here's our growth function, a of t equals 100 times e raised to the 0 0.045 times t. Then the first thing is the initial amount of bacteria. You could pull that right out of this up here if you wanted to. You could say, oh, well, the 100 is multiplied by e raised to the power. That must be the a sub 0, so that's the initial amount. That's true, 
But if you didn't see it right away, if you subbed in a zero, that would also give you the initial amount, like if you subbed in zero for t. And that's what I did down here. I said a of zero would be 100 times e raised to the 0 0.045 times zero. But then that's a zero in the exponent, e to the zero is one. So you get 100 times one, which is 100, and that is what you're supposed to get. The growth rate is, so it's k in the formula on the first page. Here the thing that's k is this, right? It's the number that's multiplied by t, so it's the 0 0.045. So k is 0 0.045, or if you want to written in percent form, 4.5%. Part C, the population after five days, there you're just substituting in. So you're saying, well then, if T equals five, because up here it says T is measured in days. So then you just sub in five for T, and then simplify this. So 0 0.045 times five, it's 0.225. And then at this point, you need a calculator. So you need a calculator to raise E to the 0.225 power and then multiply by 100. You end up with about 125.2 grams. Then D and E are a little more involved, but at least they're similar to each other. So with D, we want to see how long it would take the population to reach 140 grams. So that's saying, what value of T do you need to have A of T be 140? And so then here I said, okay, well, in order to get A of T being equal to 140, so then we just set 140 equal to what we had on the right side. So I basically just went up here to this uh, formula or this function up here. And I said, I'm gonna set A of T equal to 140 and then I'm gonna solve for T. That should give us the value of T, so how long it would take in order to get the population of 140 grams, in order to get the population to be that big. So that's what I did here. And then from here I said, well, if you divide both sides by 100, which would make sense, because then that way you'd get the e raised to the power by itself, which you want that in order to eventually get the t out of the exponent. So if you divide both sides by 100, then on the right side you just get e to the power. On the left side you have 140 over 100, which is 1.4. But now once you're on this line here, you're at the point where on the right side you've got e raised to the power. You want to get the t out of the power, so since this is base e, Take natural log of both sides, that's gonna be the simplest thing to do. So that's what I did here, natural log of 1.4 equals natural log of e raised to that power. Then that way you can bring the power out front, right? And that's multiplied by the natural log of e, but the natural log of e is one, right? Because it's what do you raise e to in order to get e? One, e to the first power is e. So that's a one. So that right side is really just 0 0.045t. So then t must be the natural log of 1.4 over 0 0.045. And if you simplify that in the calculator, you get about 7.477 days. So that's about how long it would take to get the population to be 140 grams. Then part E is how long does it take for the size of the population to double? Well, it starts off at 100 grams. And so we want to see, well, how long does it take um, to get up to 200? So we want the time it takes for A of T to become 200, or we want the value of T such that A of T is equal to 200, right? Something of that, to that effect. So we say, okay, well, we need this. We need A of T to be equal to 200. So again, we can set 200 equal to 100 E to the 0 0.045 T and then solve for T. The solving for T in part E the steps are identical to in part D. The only difference is you got a 200 here instead of a 140, but all the steps are exactly the same because you want to get e to the power by itself. So you divide both sides by 100, you end up here, right? Because 200 over 100 is two on the left side. Then you want, you want to be able to get the t out of the exponent, take the natural log of both sides. So you do that, then you can bring that 0 0.045 t out front. I didn't write it in this time because from part D, we already know natural log of E is one, right? So there would be a natural log of E here, but that's just one, so 0 0.045 T. So then T ends up being the natural log of two divided by 0 0.045. And if you use a calculator, you get about 15.403 days. And if nothing else, it seems pretty logical that the answer in E is longer, right? That it takes longer than D does because E is a bigger amount. Right? If you're starting at 100, it should take longer to get to 200 than it does to get to 140. Right? That part's just sort of common sense, right? More than, that's more common sense than math, I think. So, yeah, if nothing else, it makes sense that this number is bigger than the answer that we got in D. 
but at least the computation ends up being about the same. And any of these word problems where you have to solve for T, it's basically these steps that we did in E, which are the same as the steps that we just did in D. In the second example, we don't have as much to work with at the beginning, so we're gonna have to solve for more stuff. Because if you look in here, it says, okay, we have traces of burned wood found in an archeological dig in Chile, and approximately 1.67% of the original amount of carbon-14. And we know the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years. Okay, but where's A of T? Like, where is our function? We don't have it yet. We do know what the general form is going to be, right? This is going to be a rate of decay, right? Because as time elapses, the amount of carbon-14 that's left goes down. So this one's going to be decay, not growth. So we do know that which means that we should have a negative number for K, but where's the K? We don't have it. It looks like ultimately we're trying to solve for T because just starting after this comma, approximately when was the tree cut and burned? When, right, that sounds like time. So it seems like we're gonna solve for T eventually, and that is true. But in order to solve for T, we're gonna to need to know what K is. And there actually is a way to get it. Because this first part of the sentence, that the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years, that basically gives you this line right here. That A, the amount remaining after 5,700 years, should be one half of what you started out with. So this part right here, more or less, comes from the definition of a half-life, right? That whatever your half-life amount of time is, after that elapses, you're left with half of what you started with. So you start with A0, after 5,700 years, you're left with half of whatever A0 is. Also, also notice, we're going to solve this without actually knowing A0. Which seems a little bit weird, but it's going to work out. We're going to have to solve for K first. And we know that after 5,700 years has elapsed, so... When t is equal to 5,700, so that's why I've got the 5,700 in for t up here in the exponent, then a of 5,700 is one half of a zero. So I just substituted that in because then with this right here, we can solve for k. Because a zero, even though we don't know what it is, it's just some number. So you could divide both sides by a zero, and then you'd be left with what's down here. And then from here, on the right side, we've got e raised to the power. So if you take the natural log of both sides, you can bring the exponent out front. So there I took the natural log of both sides. And then here, I brought the exponent out front, but then it would be multiplied by the natural log of e, which is just 1. So then going down here, what k ends up being, it's the natural log of a half divided by 5,700. Uh, the natural log of a half is a negative number. Right? You're taking the natural log of something that's less than 1. You should get something that's negative. But you could also see it this way, where we could rewrite that, since this is a quotient, as the difference of two natural logs, but the natural log of 1 is 0. So this would be the negation of the natural log of 2 over 5,700. This here, it looks more like it's going to be a negative number. Um, right here, I think it's a little more direct. It's a little tiny negative number, so it's about point, negative 0 0.00001216, but it is a negative number. The important thing is now we have solved for k, and now that we have a value for k, we should be able to get a value for t when you only have 1.67% of the original amount of carbon-14. So now we can do it, because this is our formula, right? We don't know what a0 is, and in this case, we're actually never going to, but we can still answer both parts of this question, which seems kind of wild at first, but... In both cases, you just end up being able to divide A0 out. Um, and then there's K, right? The negative point zero 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 one two one six. Okay. Well, then what we're trying to figure out is the amount of elapsed time when we're left with 1.67% of the amount of carbon-14 that we started out with. So 1.67% converted into decimal form is 0 0.0167. So 0 0.0167 times A0 equal to the right side. And then if we solve for T, that'll give us the elapsed time to which at that point you would end up with that amount of carbon-14 left. 
So you got a0 on both sides as a factor. You can divide both sides by a0. You end up here, right? Because a0 is just some number, even though it's one where we don't know what it is, right? It's some number and it's clearly not zero. So that makes the division okay, right? But then now on the right side, we've got e to the power. So natural log of both sides. Then that way you can bring this exponent down and then it would be multiplied by the natural log of the e, which is just one. So then t ultimately is the natural log of 0 0.0167 divided by negative 0 0.0001216, which ends up being about 33,654 years when you put that into a calculator. And this ends up being positive because this is a negative divided by a negative, right? The natural log of 0 0.0167, right? This thing that you're taking the natural log of is less than one. So this numerator is negative. So negative over negative gives you a positive, which makes sense, right? It's an amount of elapsed time. You should get a positive number for that. Example three is another rate of decay example, just a lot faster. So in the last example, that last answer we got was like 33,000 years. Half-life of C. Borgium 266, 30 seconds. So it's still decay, just decaying much, much faster. So the first thing is get an exponential decay model. This part A is like finding K in number two, basically. Because we know what the half-life is. Right, we know the half-life is 30 seconds, so I guess now time is in terms of seconds. So we know that when we put 30 in for t, we should end up with half of what we start with for the amount. Right, so one half of a0. And then this is solvable. Right, you divide both sides by a0. You end up here. Take the natural log of both sides. Bring the 30k out front. We're going to multiply by the natural log of e, which is 1. So then k is the natural log of a half over 30. If you want to rewrite it like this, you could, but I'm assuming at this point you're just putting it into a calculator anyway. So if you did it as the natural log of 0.5, then divided by 30, you should still end up with negative 0.0231. So then here's our model, right? That's our k. We just have to put that in as the k and the exponent multiplied by t. So that's what we end up with um, as a model for the amount of C borgium left after a specified amount of elapsed time. All right, next thing is what's gonna be left after 90 seconds? The most straightforward way to do it is just put 90 in for t, right? And then you end up with a0 times e to the negative 0 0.0231 times 90, and e raised to that power ends up being about 0.125, so about 0.125 or 12.5% of a0, so of, of the original sample. Okay, there's another way to do this, which I figured was worth mentioning. Um, it's, it would be an unusual choice to do it this way, but if you use the definition of a half-life, you could say, well, one half-life happens from zero seconds to 30. But then from 30 to 60, you get another half-life, so you get a half of what you had after 30 seconds. So a half of a half of a zero would be one-fourth of a zero. But then from 60 to 90 seconds, you get another half-life. So there you get one half of one fourth a zero, which is one eighth a zero after 90 seconds. One eighth is 0.125. So it does work if you want to do it that way. So I guess if you're inclined toward chemistry and the periodic table and all that, and if you said, wait a minute, couldn't you just use the half-life definition repeatedly and get the answer here? Yes, you can. So that would also work. I think most people would do it by subbing in 90, but I figured it was worth pointing out that this would also work. And then part C, how long would it take the sample to decay to 30% of its original amount? So 30% of A0, converting that 30% to decimal form, it's 0.3. So 0.3 A0 set equal to what's on the right side of the model, right? So I just basically set A of T equal to this, the 0.3 A0. Divide both sides by A0, you end up here. And then you want to get that T out of the exponent, so you take the natural log of both sides, and bring the power down, times the natural log of E, which is 1. T ends up being the natural log of 0.3 divided by negative 0.0231, which is roughly 52 seconds. Balancing things back out with number 4. We've had one growth and two decays, so let's have another growth. So the growth of bacteria in food products like milk requires a date stamp, which basically implies that you want to use the milk 
um, before um, the bacterial count gets too high. So let's say that under certain storage conditions, the number of bacteria present in a product is modeled by this, where T is the time in days, and then A of T is the number of bacteria in millions. All right, so if it's in millions, then that means we're going to have to rewrite this number in millions, right? So that number right there, that three trillion, we're gonna have to write that in millions first. So we wanna figure out how long it would take to reach three million, but just so um, the units here match up with the units for our function, written in millions, that count is 3,000, right? 3,000 times a million would give you this back out. Or I guess you could say you take three trillion, you divide by a million, you'd end up here, right? So then that way this is written in millions, and then that's the number that you wanna use. And you wanna find t such that a of t is equal to 3,000. Okay, well then we'll set 3,000 equal to 500 e to the 0.1 times t. Divide both sides by 500, you end up there. And then you take the natural log of both sides because we're trying to get that t out of the exponent. Then you can bring the power out front times natural log of e, but that's one. So t ends up being the natural log of six over 0.1, or I guess 10 times the natural log of six, if you want to write it like that, which is about 17.918 days or 18 to round off. And then part B, if t equals zero, corresponds to January 1st, what date should be placed on the product. Um, okay, well then, um, if that's when the bacteria starts growing, when t equals zero, then we want to make sure that the date stamp matches up with the day where it's gonna hit three trillion. So 18 days later, right? Because we'd figured out it takes 18 days to get A of t to be three trillion, at least in ones, three trillion, in millions, 3,000. So January 1st, add 18 days from part A, you get January 19th.